Sometime back in the <clears throat> 1860s, a man called Robert Roberts, who I think we've all heard of, delivered uh, a series of 12 lectures to a small audience in Huddersfield in order to demonstrate that the beliefs of the churches of his day were astray from the teaching of the Bible. And following those lectures, he received a lot of requests for copies of his talks, and eventually they were compiled with the addition of another six lectures into a book there we go, a book called Christendom Astray. And in that book he looked at a, a number of commonly held teachings of the churches and compared those teachings well, with what the Bible actually teaches. And he found, sadly, that many of the beliefs that people generally accept without question as being the truth of Bible teaching are in fact completely foreign to the Bible, so much so that the result of those errors of teaching is to put people's future salvation at serious risk. So what's the purpose of our talk today? Well, we want to look at some of the commonly held beliefs of Christianity today and to see if the same problem of being astray from the Bible still exists. And to do that, we're going to briefly outline something of the history of the Christian church in the process seeing how a lot of these errors of teaching came in and we want to look at a small number of those teachings and see what the Bible really teaches about them and then to think about whether it really matters that our beliefs are the same as Bible teaching and we'll finish with some thoughts on how to find out <clears throat> for ourselves what the truth really is. And of course the purpose of our talk this afternoon isn't to rubbish other people's beliefs, sincerely held as they may well be. We're not here to rubbish those or to pour scorn on them. All we want to do is to show how over the years it's a sad fact that serious errors have indeed crept in and they've been uh, become accepted as being the truth. And so I want to show that the only way to see these errors and to distinguish them from truth is to go back to the source to see what the Bible really does teach. So what is then the source of Christianity? Well, going right back to the start of things to do with Christianity, Jesus Christ himself was born sometime around 4 BC, not 0 BC as we'd expect because of, there was a, an error of calculation by the, the chap who worked out when Jesus was supposed to have been born. It was probably nearer 4 BC when he was actually born. And the uh, teaching of Jesus and his ministry began when he was about 30 years old and he, he was going around the land of Israel teaching for about three and a half years. And the message that Jesus taught was about the coming kingdom of God on the earth and about how individuals should live in order to be members of that kingdom that was coming. And his teaching was firmly based on the teachings of the Old Testament scriptures, on the, the Bible of the Jewish people. Now the religious leaders of his day refused to accept the teachings that he was giving to them and they arranged to have him silenced by crucifixion. But the writings of Jesus' followers tell us that three days later Jesus rose from the dead and then 40 days after that ascended into heaven. But before Jesus left them he commissioned his followers, his apostles, to take his teachings and to take the message of his resurrection and the message of salvation from sin and death, to take that message to the Jewish people first of all and then on to the Gentiles and thence to the rest of the world. And as a result of that teaching by Jesus' followers, many churches were established throughout the Roman Empire. Although they were often persecuted, firstly by Jewish opposition, the same Jewish opposition that had had Jesus put to death, and later by the Roman emperors. Now the teachings of the early church were firmly based on the teachings of Jesus himself, and those teachings were then passed on very carefully by his apostles. And during the first 70 years or so after the death of Jesus and his resurrection, the records of Jesus' ministry and of his teachings 
were written down by the eyewitnesses who had been there, who would seen Jesus, who would heard him, and also by others who had had direct contact with those eyewitnesses. And these writings were eventually compiled into what we now know as the New Testament. <clears throat> and the fact that the New Testament was written down by people who had direct knowledge of what Jesus had done and what he'd said means that it's an accurate record of what Christianity is and what the teachings of Jesus are. However, in AD 312, the Roman Emperor Constantine claimed to have had a conversion experience and he converted to Christianity. And about 70 years later, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And once that had happened, once the official state religion became Christianity, several things happened. Firstly, Christians were no longer persecuted and instead it was followers of other religions, of pagan religions, that found themselves being persecuted and many pagans were forced to convert to Christianity but of course without a true change of heart. Thus many of them brought with them their former pagan beliefs and those beliefs gradually became absorbed into Christianity and so things like icons and elaborate architecture and pilgrimages, the veneration of saints, festivals, alternative ideas about life after death and alternative ideas about the nature of God. All these sorts of things gradually became absorbed into Christianity and all these changed the church as these ideas and practices became absorbed into it. During the following centuries there were conferences and councils that were held to try and make peace between those that held these various different ideas and to try to determine what was the official church doctrine. And being now a state religion with all the attendant power and influence in the world that it had the Roman church became corrupt and it moved away from the original teachings of Christ and his apostles embracing instead so many of these external ideas that came from the pagan religions which is just what the Apostle Paul said in our reading that we read together in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4 where he said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. <clears throat> Now all of this over time eventually led to the Reformation which occurred in the 16th century. In 1517 a German monk called Martin Luther made a stand against the established church and against its corruptions and thus he started the Reformation and principally the idea of the Reformation was that the teaching of the Bible was the supreme authority and not church tradition. And while that was an, an ex excellent foundation for reformation, unfortunately, once again, over the intervening, year, intervening centuries, that important principle has again been glossed over and lost. So that today, many churches still have little regard for the Bible as a supreme authority and its teachings, the teachings of the Bible, have once again been manipulated to suit the beliefs of different groups. And the result is that today, as has been the case for a long time, Christendom as a whole preaches a number of ideas that are wholly foreign to the teaching of the Bible. Ideas that are a long way from the simple gospel message taught by Jesus Christ, whose teachings they profess to follow. So what are the teachings that people generally accept as being Christian beliefs but that are in reality different from the teaching of the Bible, different from what Jesus Christ himself taught? Well we could make quite a list but not all the ideas that are held by the different denominations in Christianity are held by all of them 
different denominations have different versions of what they claim Christianity is and what the teaching should be. That's why there are so many different churches calling themselves Christian. And over the years there have been a great number of what we might call mini reformations where groups of people have found themselves disagreeing over what they believe and that's caused splits and divisions as groups have broken away to form their own denominations formed by people who adhere to a particular viewpoint and it's all very sad isn't it but it's really inevitable once people start to apply external thinking instead of simply sticking to what the Bible says so what we're going to do is to build up a, a quick list of some of the ideas that are held in mainstream Christianity. I suppose a big one is the idea of the Trinity, the idea that God is actually made up of three persons yet is still only one person. An idea that most churches will admit is incomprehensible but that nonetheless must be believed. The idea of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost or God the Holy Spirit. But when we look at the Bible we find that the Bible what the Bible really teaches is much simpler. It teaches us that God is one, that he is the Father, and that Jesus Christ is his Son. The Holy Spirit is simply God's power. And the idea of the Trinity just doesn't appear anywhere at all in the Bible. I suppose connected with the idea of the Trinity is the idea of Mary being the mother of God which I suppose is a natural extension of the idea that Jesus is actually the second person of God himself. But the Bible never suggests that idea anywhere and simply presents Mary as the mortal mother of Jesus. Another idea that's commonly held is that all mankind has an immortal soul that goes to heaven at one's death. That's very commonly believed and taught. But what the Bible teaches is that man is mortal, that we die as a punishment for our sins and that death is the total end of our lives. The only future hope that we have is what the Bible teaches, that people who have tried to obey God in their lives will be resurrected at the return of Jesus to the earth and be granted immortality then if they're judged to have been faithful. According to most church teaching the reward for those who have lived a good life will be to live a life forever in heaven. But the Bible is quite clear that the reward is actually to be raised from the dead to then live forever in God's kingdom here on the earth. And by contrast, although it's less commonly talked about these days, the punishment for the wicked is usually taught to be everlasting torture in hell, wherever that's supposed to be. Whereas the Bible says that the wicked will simply die and cease to exist forever with no hope of any future life. Connected with that is the idea of the source of wrong and evil in the world which is often attributed to the devil or to Satan, usually identified as a fallen angel, a wicked opposer of God. Whereas the Bible is very clear in stating that sin, wrongdoing and wrong thinking and all opposition from God to God comes from human sin, human wrong thinking, human self-centeredness because people so often want to do well we want to do what we think is best don't we instead of obeying the principles of life that have been laid down by God in the Bible baptism is a practice that is sometimes encouraged in some churches but more often than not it's regarded as something that's optional not essential at all Christening is very often put forward as a more valid and perhaps easier alternative and most people don't even know the difference between the two. But the Bible is quite clear that only true baptism is acceptable to God. Full immersion in water, the Bible tells us, is essential. Some churches make a big thing out of the idea that we can possess the Holy Spirit today. 
thus giving us miraculous abilities and special spiritual insight, faith healing and things like that. But the Bible shows us that possession of the Holy Spirit died out with the apostles at the end of the first century because it was no longer needed to show us the way to Christ since the Bible by that time had been completed and it's the Bible that now gives us all the spiritual insight that we need. The idea of saints is big in some churches saints being defined as good holy Christians who have in particular done some miraculous deed during their lives that's how they're described in that context anyway as the, the churches seem to see them but the Bible uses the word saints in a completely different way it, it's used to describe all true Christians all who are faithfully trying to do God's will during their lives are described as saints in the Bible. Many churches have a priesthood, but the Bible presents Jesus as our only high priest, and we are simply the members of his church. There never was a priesthood in the first century church. This was something that only became established as Christianity became adopted as a state religion, and the authority of the state was brought to bear. So that's just a list of some of the ways in which mainstream Christianity has moved away from the original straightforward teaching of the first century gospel message that was taught by Jesus and that's recorded for us in the Bible. There are other things that we could mention such as the idea of transubstantiation, women priests, certain moral issues and so on but uh, I'm sure you've got the idea and I, I was surprised just how many wrong ideas, how many ideas that are completely different from what the Bible teaches there are that are taught in general in the churches. And the shocking thing is that most of these ideas just do not come from the Bible at all. They've been imported from those pagan religions that we spoke about earlier, brought in when Roman pagan worshippers were forced to convert to Christianity but didn't leave their pagan ideas behind and over the years those ideas have gradually become absorbed into church thinking and they've corrupted the truth leading people away from truth and into error so let's spend the rest of our, our time together this afternoon just looking at one or two of these issues in a little more detail just to highlight how important it is to believe what the Bible teaches rather than accepting man-made ideas instead one of these ideas is the practice of baptism that I said had been either declared to be something that's not essential or it had been replaced with the practice of christening so what does the Bible say about baptism? Well, the Gospel records of the life and the ministry of Jesus tell us that Jesus himself was baptised by John the Baptist. The record tells us a number of facts. Um, Matthew chapter 3 there says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptised by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptised by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he consented. So we can see from that little passage there, can't we, that Jesus was that John was first of all reluctant to baptise Jesus. He felt his need for baptism was greater. But Jesus told him that it was necessary for him to be baptised in order for righteousness to be fulfilled so we could say just as a, a simple point to draw from that that if it was necessary for Jesus to be baptized then surely it's absolutely essential for his followers to be baptized John chapter 3 and verse 23 says that John was baptizing at a place called Enon near Salem because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptised. And I think this tells us something about the form that baptism should take. 
If John was simply sprinkling the people with water, as he's done with the practice of christening, then he wouldn't. He, he could have done that anywhere, couldn't he? He wouldn't have needed much water. But because he was practicing a baptism of full immersion, he needed this place where there was much water where he could do it, because he was fully immersing the people in that water. Indeed, the, the word baptism itself comes from a Greek word which means to fully immerse, just like a dyer of cloth fully immerses a garment in the dye. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 says go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this is Jesus as he's about to leave his disciples and ascend into heaven and he's giving them that commission to teach and baptize showing that just as baptism was essential for him so it is for any who wish to follow him. And also in Mark chapter 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So he's making it quite clear, isn't he, that both belief and baptism are essential in order to be saved. Without these, there can be no salvation. And the New Testament goes on to show that the followers of Jesus did as Jesus commanded. They taught and they baptised those who came to believe. And all the examples where we are told about people being baptised show that they were all fully immersed in water after they'd come to believe. So it's easy to see then, isn't it, that the alternative views of infant sprinkling or the view that baptism isn't essential views that are commonly held in many parts of Christendom today, those ideas are a long way astray from the truth of what the Bible and what Jesus himself teaches. The other idea that we're going to look at that's put forward by Christendom is the idea of the Trinity. This is an idea that needs a whole evening really to consider it properly but I'll just try to summarise some of the issues and we'll see that it's another area where mainstream church teaching is astray from Bible truth. And I suppose the first point to note, a very simple point really, is that the word Trinity never occurs even once in the Bible. I think that's just quite a telling fact on its own, isn't it? Secondly, the Old Testament consistently speaks about God as being one, the only God, and that there is no other. For example, Deuteronomy chapter four, verse one, that says, chapter six, verse four, sorry, that says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." And Isaiah chapter forty-six, verse nine says, "I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me." And there are plenty of other passages represent, presenting the same message that God is one, that he is the only God. And these passages never mention any idea of being three in one and certainly never use the word Trinity. In the New Testament, Jesus himself reinforces the same ideas. In Mark chapter 12, he says, which command, well, somebody asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he's quoting that Deuteronomy passage that we looked at a moment ago. And that shows, doesn't it, that Jesus upheld the Old Testament idea of God being one alone. But in addition to that, Jesus puts himself in an inferior position to God. John chapter 5 he says I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of him who sent me and similarly in chapter 14 he says the father is greater than I so Jesus is not he never said he was he's not part of God either he is inferior to God as he says here 
he's subject to the will of God and does what God instructs him to do he's inferior to God and he's subject to his father's will when Jesus was speaking about the date of his return he clearly states that he didn't know when it would be Mark chapter 13 he says but concerning that day or that hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father so he's saying that nobody knew the date when he was going to come back even Jesus himself didn't know the date only God did and that's a fact that makes no sense whatsoever if Jesus was indeed the very God as the Trinity doctrine teaches us the early Christians also held the same teachings that God is the supreme father and Jesus is his son two distinct beings first Timothy chapter 2 for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus and first Corinthians chapter 8 yet for us there is one God the father from whom are all things and for uh, for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist and these two passages I think clearly show that there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ two completely distinct beings and no mention of anything to do with a trinity there are lots of other passages that we could refer to to show that the idea has, of the trinity has nothing to do whatsoever with bible teaching indeed I think if they were pressed the teachers would the churches would actually admit that the bible does not teach the doctrine of trinity itself it's, it, it's an idea that doesn't come from bible teaching so that's a, a slightly more in depth look at just a couple of examples of where Christendom the churches generally in their doctrines are astray from bible truth and we could go on we could look at some of the others but uh, I think we'll leave it at that suffice to say that there is a very simple answer to this problem of who we should believe when we're trying to find out the truth of what the Bible teaches and it's as simple as that to read the Bible itself if it's a true fact as we've seen that many churches are teaching ideas that are astray from what the Bible teaches then the only answer is to go back to the Bible to read the Bible and to find out what it truly is telling us the Bible makes many wonderful and valuable promises for our future but its promises are firmly dependent on us doing things God's way not our own way the variety of opinions around us shows that we can't rely on anyone's views to tell us what it God's way is however sincerely those opinions might be held we can't rely on anybody's views therefore everything must be tested against the Bible to determine what the truth is and we would say don't even believe us the Christadelphians check and test everything we say against the Bible because believing the truth is so important and this is exactly what the Bible itself tells us to do to test everything that we are presented with against the Bible Isaiah chapter 8 to the law and to the testimony if they do not speak according to this word it is because there is no light in them Acts chapter 17 speaking about uh, one of the early churches it says that these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so they were checking in their bible to see whether the ideas that they were being taught by the apostles of Jesus were actually true and first John chapter 4 beloved he says do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world I think that speaks for itself doesn't it there are so many conflicting teachings presented to us 
as being supposedly the truth of what Christianity is all about but many of these are those false prophets that John is writing about there peddling false beliefs beliefs that are astray from the truth and so we would urge anyone wouldn't we anyone who wants to learn the truth to read their Bible for themselves to come to understand what it teaches and then come to God in the way that God asks of us because there really is no other way to be saved.